record this. Oh, now, great. I've, now I've never recorded before and I'm a little bit nervous about recording, but I mean, not because I'm nervous, but uh, just, I, so what I think I'm going to do is either upload it to our, to my Gmail if I can, or if the file is too large because we're a two hour class, I might have to upload it to YouTube. It and says, then, excuse me, it says here, if we go up to our own screen where it says a meeting, uh -huh. if there's a record button, if we push that, it says, please request record permission from the meeting host. Yes. So maybe for the next class, that might be a... I'm going to try to record them myself. And what I'd like to do is like release them to you guys for a week. Um, oh, okay. I'm not gonna object, I'm not gonna object, but let's talk about, I don't know what kind of a request permission you need from me. Um, but I mean, I, I, I mean, if you guys record me, I mean, it's like when you go to a concert, I mean, people make recordings of things all the time. I mean, just that you're respectful of my, you know, creative property. And I, I mean, I've never, I would try, I don't have any issues. I'm happy to share information and I'm not sharing anything. Um, out of you know unusual or that's going to affect me down the road or any of you we're just learning here okay so this is uh this book is wonderful it's the art of encaustic painting and one of the things i really like about it is it's divided up in chapters and it definitely has a beautiful chapter on um makeshift safety fans like and sort of how to uh, maybe put a window fan in a window near you right so or um create oh, that's great. yeah create even a little exhaust system so i have a huge exhaust i don't know if you guys can see it but do you see that big metal so yeah, i have yeah. quite a large uh extraction fan system thing i i don't i mean only occasionally do i actually use it like when i'm really work like when i work on those big pieces i might turn it on um in general like yes question can can you use the air conditioning fan because i have air conditioning in my studio and i can leave the fan on all the time and would that suck the air out i think if as long as you're circulating air and you're not in any type of an air tight environment mm -hmm. i think you're fine i okay. really do i i think that um if you're working on like i was saying an extremely large piece that's like 48 by 60, I'm gonna be using larger quantities of encaustic paint. Um, I'm just gonna make sure my windows are open, my fans are on. I think the idea is just moving air, right? And if you wanna wear your little uh, COVID mask that you're wearing to the grocery <laughs> store, I mean, the idea, right, is that, is that everything has um, matter, right? So even, wax as it burns because it's organic it's exuding some type of tiny little matter into the air and then that goes into your mouth down your throat and into your lungs with the air right yes. and god knows what else we're consuming with our air and right now our whole entire world is upside down because of what we're taking in through our mouth right mm -hmm. that we can't see it's invisible so even beeswax in its most organic, like, you know, straight out of, straight out of the hive, straight out of the hive, you know, like looking like this, like the, right out of the bees, butt, like has probably some little things in it that when you melt it and you breathe it in, it's like, oh, hi, I'm in your lungs and I'm from wax and you're, you know, all air. Like I, I I've been working with encaustics in open air and circulating air, you know, for, for 20 years. Plus I did a ton of darkroom work and I feel fine. I mean, I feel fine. I know a lot of photographers who did 10 or 15 years of darkroom work who are not fine. So, um, you know, but certain colors, you guys, and if you noticed on fine art stores website, when you go through the colors, they'll have the colors that are more toxic will have little symbols next to them right and you i'm gonna hopefully start to begin to to teach you how your options for adding color okay so i do think that every artist even within a medium still has a lot of choices 
of how they of how they add color. Okay, so we'll, we can talk about that. Um, so anyway, this book is great. It talks about a lot of different types of encaustic paintings, um, a lot of different surfaces, and it's just it's nice to have around because it's an all around um, studio book. You know, Who's it's not just. Say that again. The author. Joanne. Oh yes. So, so this is Joanne Matera, who is also the founder of the Encaustic Conference, which normally happens every last week. It was would have been last week, and uh, it was canceled this year. But it would have been uh, in Provincetown. Um, and if you got, if you guys love, if you all love Encaustics forever, and you're married to the, you want to marry them. We, maybe we can all go next year. Maybe we can all go next year. Um, but you, you know, it's sort of one of those things. I, I don't know where each of you are on your encaustic love affair, but there's definitely a world. There's a, there is an encaustic world out there of museums and artists and art centers and um, workshops and encaustic camp and encaustic residencies. And so it's been a really, really awesome experience for me growing into it from being a photographer and growing into it through my which through my hybrid my hybrid of what i do in caustic photography right okay your evolution <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. That's really cool. um okay so today i'm going to work with the materials that i sent you i'm going to be working with um you know, I, I, this is actually a paint roller and um, I'm, I use it um, on my under, under paintings. So to me, after you get your prints, your photos, um, your black and white photos, whatever print material you're gonna work with, there are, there's really like this whole, what I call like microcosm of possibilities of things that you can do to prepare your print. Um, I, I, it, I don't really have a great analogy for this, although it's kind of like, the first thing that just popped in my head is kind of like packing for a little weekend vacation. Like what you're gonna put in that suitcase is basically gonna carry the mood of the whole trip. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like how you wanna dress it up and like, what you want to style with it and how you want to accessorize this print and what mood or you know um, atmosphere you're going to give to this print is kind of those decisions are made i think when you're prepping the print to add the wax it sort of sets the tone of like the rest of the event right or the piece um so i'm going to talk about that um i'm going to show a bunch of examples we're going to talk about substrates we're gonna talk about gluing. Um, I'm gonna demo. Now I, if you guys wanna work while I'm working um, and actually glue your prints, that's fine. So I'll go through like setup. If you wanna just watch, that's totally fine too. There will, I have no, you have to do it this way or that way. Um, what, what do you suggest? What do you think's the best way? Um, I kind of feel like if we do, if we do certain things together, I feel like we might, but, um, I don't, you know, if somebody feels like they're taking too long or need more time, I don't want to be like, I am, I'm a fast worker. I, I mean, people have told me that. I mean, I, I guess I'm aware of it, but I, um, uh, and also I'm teaching the class, so I know what I'm going to do next. Like, I know what I'm going to show you and I know, so if I'm going too fast, I, I think that we can try waiting or I can just say, hey, I'm just gonna try to get through this, show you, and then see how you feel. Um, if you're in your, how many of you are in your studio space? I am. I am. Okay, I am. and how many, how many of you successfully got your prints printed and ready to go? Oh. Ready to go today? I, I did. I did. Okay. Uh, okay. So I would say, I mean, in a way, if you only have a certain amount of art time and this class is sort of part of your art time, you might want to make something with me. And also it might be 
uh, a little bit more of a learning experience for you to be able to ask me something while we're doing it. Um, if you want to just take a pass, I'm, that's fine. And you can try it on your own. Okay. Also, I'm not going to break for two hours unless I have a bladder, unless I have, <laughs> unless I have to go. But if you guys, if you guys need to go, please just go, right? You don't have to announce it. Like, I get it. I won't be offended. I know you're coming back. I know you love me. Um, okay. So, oh, my poor, oh my God, you guys, my poor dog is like, like trying to get on my lap because of the thunder. Um, oh. I know. It's crazy. All right. So, uh, any questions so far? Can you guys hear? Everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to turn up my volume a little bit just so I can hear. Okay. So, I'm going to change my, uh, I'm actually sitting down. So, I'm going to go ahead and change my, um, angle and I'm going to point you guys towards my table and I how's that is that good can everybody see yes uh -huh. okay so you're not gonna see my face but you're gonna see my hands so I wanted to do this cute little um, demonstration which involves cut right kitchen wax paper and this is a funny little story but this is actually how my whole encaustic experience started was I basically just took a black and white. It was a picture of a naked of a naked woman standing against a white wall, right? And I just took the photo and I took the wax paper <laughs> and I just took a nice, um, you know, PVA glue. This is the PVA glue that I like. Sorry, it's like backlit right now. I'm gonna, right, you guys got the PVA glue? Yep. And I just mm -hmm. brushed it. I brushed it on the photo and I glued the wax paper down. <laughs> and I mean, you can see how beautiful, right? I'm going to have to, I'm going to move the computer first. I'm going to move the computer, you guys, so you're not back. So you're not backlit. Okay, here you go. So, I mean, look how beautiful, right? It is. And then what's really cool, okay, is that if as you, oh, sorry, there's a glass. As you move the paper, wax paper away, away from the photo, you get more blur. Do you see how that happens? So the closer the wax paper is to the photo, the clearer the photo is. But as you move the paper away on the curve, on the curve, right, the more uh, blurry and obscure that those other parts of the photo get, okay? So what I'm trying to illustrate and demonstrate to you is that that is exactly what you're gonna end up doing with the wax, right? So the thinner the wax layer is over the photo, the clearer the photo will be, the sharper it will be, okay? And the thicker the wax, the more blurred and foggy and more obscured the wax, the, the photo will be in relationship to the wax, right? So if you want to get some wax paper, this is also a really good test to decide if a photo is going to look good oh, with the wax. That's a good tip, Leah. Right. So all you need to do is print the photo and you could even print it like five by seven, right? And take a piece of wax paper over it and lay it over there and then just start to move it around. The other thing that you should do is like what is really, I don't know about you, everybody else, but I, I use my phone, right? Uh, my camera phone on my phone as my number one uh, editing helper. So if I am looking at a painting or working on a painting, if I can't seem to feel what's next or what I need to do or how it's going or I'm just feeling stressed, I take a picture of it and then I go into my uh, Instagram, my Insta apps and I just start to play around with what if I added more contrast? What if I decreased the color? What if I cropped it? And I can do all of that with technology and I cannot tell you how much it helps my brain edit the work that I'm doing with my hands. Okay, so 
like right here, I'm just gonna, and I'm gonna post, you know, in the Google album, some of the pictures that I take during class time. And I think I just posted this picture on my Instagram like yesterday, but watch what I'm doing. So I'm just, I'm taking my camera, I'm taking the wax paper over the piece and I'm lifting like the bottom corner and then I'm going over here, right? And I'm lifting the top corner and I'm taking these different pictures, right? And again, like just like nice flat, window light or you know um nothing too strong or reflective for the lighting and what it's showing me is how i can blur how i can blur and abstract portions of the photo um i don't know if you guys can see this can you see but can you see how beautiful yeah, yeah. so if we can just start right off the bat to start to translate photography and adding wax this is exactly like what we're doing we're basically obscuring the image by sort of veiling like look how beautiful this is it is wow. right Very and this is like yeah. so easy peasy like all done in my phone we're gonna do it the harder way which would be like the <laughs> more permanent way of course we are. Are. <laughs> but i just thought that this would be so fun and this you guys is exactly where i started as like a college junior or senior so frustrated with the photography department and just really wanting to quit photography altogether um and then i sort of started to play around with this wax paper on the photos and bookmaking and like everything just sort of kind of came together after the after that mm -hmm. moment. But really experimentation, experimentation. Now I didn't actually start using wax until about two or three years later. Um, so I worked a lot with layering and gluing papers to papers um, as, a, as sort of my technique for a long time. Okay, uh, any questions on that? All right, so I'm gonna put the wax paper away. <laughs> oh. And one more thing I wanted to say about that. So the reason too that I think photographers really love encaustic wax and waxing is also goes back to all of our historical photographic processes, even um, back to the pictorial list who actually treated their final prints with a layer of beeswax, like Steichen did that to his landscapes. Um, it's a beautiful coating surface and it's a preservative, right? It also really ties into, I think, our love of shallow depth of field, right? Like shooting at two, eight or four and creating sort of dreamy, that dreamy feeling of not knowing exactly what is happening in the image or if it's movement or illusion or fog or what those other sort of magical um, organic elements might be, right? Okay. Um, I want everybody to, um, I think I wanted everybody to work on three images. So of course I have more than three here, but they're from one photo shoot, so that's good. So um, I kind of liked like this one. Um, but I, I think I did, wait, I'm gonna see. Oh, okay, so I did a black and white version, right? So these are two different um, filters and I use a filter program called Alien Skin. Alien Skin. Yeah. Um, and now I don't know that anybody needs to run out and buy Alien Skin because I'm pretty sure that you can get a lot of filtration opportunities through, um, uh, what's that? Oh, through, uh, well, definitely through, maybe even Bridge. Wait, what's the light? Oh, through Lightroom or through Google. I mean, I even take photos into my Google photo drive and then right to the left, there's like all those same sort of Instagram-y techniques, you know, uh, Dega, I don't even, food, 
I don't even know what they all are called anymore, but um, if you want to just stick to the straight black and white, that is definitely my favorite. And the reason that I encourage people to start with a black and white is because it speaks to um, pa painters processes of starting your painting with like a charcoal rendering or uh, a line drawing. Okay. So I like to sort of have that sort of origin of painters. So what I'm looking for when I first look at this is like just outside line and blacks and whites. Okay. Now, sometimes when I first start, I might actually take uh, a pen, a black pen, um, or a piece of chalk. If I feel like I don't have enough contrast in my photo, when I first when I first start out, right? So I might take a piece of black chalk, or even like a black pen, even a um, charcoal pen, just a regular pencil. You could even play around. Um, I really like these woody crayons. This is a woody crayon. It is like a wax. It's like a wax crayon. They're they're called Stabilos. It's S T A B I L O. And what I like to do is I like to start the rough, like the roughing up or sort of the drawing elements of my piece like this. So here's my photo. So I might just start doing some outside line shading, right? With the black, right? So, it, and really, I just think it helps when you add the wax. It's sort of, and also it just sort of starts to loosen you up and sort of you, and I like to expand my reality. So for me, like I, I want these flowers to go outside of where they existed only in the photo. So do you see how I, I start drawing outside here and see the diamonds that I have on this wall? I might start to continue these diamonds, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, things that I sort of take from my photo or from my imagination and I just start to play, right? So this is one of the ways that I play. And then I could alternate my materials because the woody crayon is going to be different than, than the chalk, right? So the chalk, because the chalk is dry and rubbable, right? So I'm going to be able to blur it. Does that, do you see how, and the wax crayon, I cannot blur. I can't really move it on this, this surface, right? So I just sort of start to play with, with mark making and sort of expanding the photo into this drawing, right? This sort of rendering of this girl and all these flowers, okay? So that's one technique. Another technique that I might use when I first start out in my prep of my, of my photo is sandpaper, okay? And to me, the sandpaper is um, like, this would be in photography terms, this would be burning, right? Adding darkness, burning in areas to make them darker. And this would be dodging, right? So for anybody that had experience in the dark room, this is what I call a dodging tool. So I can go in and rub the sandpaper and start to lift, lift the ink, right? These are also what I call like texture techniques, right? So I can really kind of think about lights and darks and kind of adding. Now, if I wanted to actually use this to completely like get rid of content, I might think about getting rid of her elbow, right? Because I really want the focus to be about these, these flowers. And I'm already sort of thinking that I want these flowers to feel like they're rising up in this composition. So I might go like in here and like literally just to like start to remove her elbow, right? And maybe even this hand a little bit because I'm not as interested in, in speaking to 
the portrait as I am speaking to the mood and floral aspects of this photograph, okay? So I'm like technically removing, using the sandpaper, a little bit of the detail of the photo, okay? Question? Yes. Leah, when you say that you use the sandpaper for texture, do you mean physically texturizing the paper so the paper's rougher, or do you mean using it more in a visual sense to like manipulate that image? Um, I'm gonna say I do I, I do both. I mean, here 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 is a yeah. example of a visual texture. Okay. So you can see the striation marks, you can see the texture. It's almost like adding a, a stencil over top or, um, but I like it. I mean, I really actually am already just loving the idea of like vertical lines, like, and maybe when I'm, cause I can start to think ahead to maybe like obscuring her face with like stripes coming up, right? So sometimes when I'm doing like the under, the under, prep like this. I just do things that I, that feel good to me. And a lot of my physicality with the artwork is, is, is what I call like almost anxiety releasing. So I don't, I'm not intellectualizing it. I'm just kind of going for it. And I'm also sort of trying to create contrast between sharpness which to me sharpness represents like reality and abstraction which is um like that the dream space or the um abstract realms of where the art can go right um so again like this image i might start to get get rid of the formal aspects of it kind of bring forth the more um informal so like the the elbow is very sharp to me and formal and speaks to all kinds of posing or portraits or fashion like a lot of things that we like can intellectualize so i might start to like work those parts away to evoke more of the dreamy floral organic qualities of the imagery um so that's kind of where i'm going with it <clears throat> but lightning adding physical texture by roughing up the paper and visual texture by changing the way it looks. Um, okay, so if I really get, you gotta be a little bit careful. I mean, you don't want to uh, put a hole in it or do you? I mean, <laughs> or, maybe you or, do. <laughs> or maybe you do. I've definitely done that. But, um, but I can tell you for sure, <laughs> But I can tell you for sure, like, I like this image a lot better where I'm not just looking at her freaking elbow. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. That, that was not the most important part of this photo to me. And that's like all I could see. Right? Okay. Love it. So here's two examples. And now I, I don't really think that there's a right and a wrong. Like, I don't think that you have to draw first or sand first. And technically, if you draw first and then you sand, you can manipulate the drawing, right? And there's, there's only going to be a few times where I say that order matters. But right now, right now, order does not matter, okay? But I will tell you when it does. Okay. Um, any questions on that? So at this point, you're just thinking about blacks and whites, texture, lights and darks, very contrasty. Um, I, I like looking at this. Yes, I'm thinking about um, composition and I'm thinking about expanding reality. So like, I'm already thinking like, this is turning into like a big, like this could be like feathers. This whole floral thing can go right up here into this whole space. Like I'm sort of setting 
uh, setting the, the stage for things that can blossom, right? Things that can come. And it's interesting <clears throat> for me because I was never, I mean, I always liked to draw, but I was not a drawer. So over the years, I've definitely, as I've been practicing more drawing, I definitely am figuring out what my lines look like. Um, you know, so uh, that's even a hard thing to kind of explain, but like, okay, so my lines, when I draw, my lines look like this, or I think that my drawing lines look a lot like my cursive writing, which is something <laughs> I, so like, these are some of what I would say are my drawing lines. So somebody else's drawing lines could be, you know, slashes, you know, that could just be something uh, like um, hashtags, right? This could be somebody else's like internal sort of drawing marks. And then, and I mean, I, I like those. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a slash or a, right? So, but that's a totally different, that's a totally different vibe than sort of like just elaborating a flower or drawing a little curly cue or following the outside line of something I always really like to do. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but look how much more dimension I get just from adding this black mm -hmm. line here, right? And then some of my techniques I've learned from listening and loving and reading about oil painters. So like Gerhard Richter, he always said, draw a straight line. He always said, draw a straight line in painting, right? A straight line. And then give it what he called a one, two, one, two, right? A one, two, one, two. So this is definitely me. Like I am not attracted to a straight line, but if you start talking about blurring that and expanding that and taking that out of its context of just a straight line. Like, I like that a lot better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I much prefer the softened straight line than the solid straight line. Okay. So these are just some fun techniques to sort of what I call like start loosening it up, right? To sort of get your mark making, your ideas in there. Um, and these were very simple tools, right? Chalk, pencil, um, you could use a heavy lead pencil. Uh, you can use a wax crayon. You can use a Sharpie. Um, you just have to remember that every tool is um, very specific for what it does. And I'm actually sad. I'm sad right now that I don't have a Sharpie, but like, I don't know about you guys, but what, what's your favorite thing to do with a Sharpie? Or any Doodle. Other? What is it? <laughs> Doodle. <laughs> Doodle, but I don't know if you, have you guys, but Sharpies make the best dots, right? So, and I think- Oh, yeah. Really I, think, I think really, like, I think really all markers are pretty awesome because they're like basically saturated ink point, you know, ink points. So, <clears throat> and this is actually one of my favorite things to actually also do with the wax, but like, um, you know, repetitive dotting, you know, and if that becomes an, a, an integrated part of an area of the photo or a background area of the photo, I mean, that could be something really beautiful. Cool. Yeah. And that's like a totally different sort of, ex and I'm going to just put some dots in here. This is a very meditative, beautiful process. And this is so nice. And you guys have to remind me to do this again into the wax because you'll just like die. It's so beautiful when you put these little holes in the wax and then put some pigment stick over them. And then they uh -huh. just all like kind of shine out as these like little beautiful um, worm holes or they look like, um, like little sea, sea barnacles on the rocks. I mean, there's just right little... So like, and, and then what's nice about, what's nice about it too, is that you start to have sort of large areas of texture and then tiny areas of texture, right? 
So you oh. have you have these two to beautiful this kind of relationship too about like teeny tiny delicate and like bigger broader right in the same in the same genre, in the same realm okay i'm gonna move on is everybody okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everyone good all right yeah so um i have a, about one two three i have like four i have like six prints here um one of the things that i always like to talk about and i'm not going to talk about this for too long is um oh here wait we got we got some people coming in hold on i got renee coming on hang on you guys i think she was just calling me okay um hi renee hi how are you I'm good. Sorry, I'm late. Oh my God! Don't worry. Uh, we've recorded. I think I'm recording, or okay. Andrea, or Andrea's recording. Hi, God. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, just I'm not, but you can. are. <laughs> you guys can, and I. I even tell people when I'm giving like lectures if they want to like record on their phone. I mean, we all learn differently. Um, some people can listen and learn. Some people have to see and learn. Some people have to do, it's all fine. I'm, I totally understand. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna just grab, I have to grab, uh, I can get over here. So one of the things I also um, like to bring to everyone's attention is your, uh, your edges. And we'll talk about, we're gonna talk about mounting photos. So I have this, um, panel the 16 by 20 panel that i have over here and i have like a t-square i have a metal t-square i have an old like elementary school uh wood ruler i have a razor blade over here um so i i, I tear a lot of my edges and if i'm tearing edges um i'm gonna put them like in a float frame so this is kind of neat because so this is sort of an example I can actually show you so like this is a uh, an encaustic photo that's in a float frame so I just have like a little spacer in here this is a straight edge but there's no white paper on it and there's no mat so it's sitting it's sitting on top of a mat board in a frame and that's a paper piece if you leave the edges, and I'll show you how, if you leave the edges, you can have the piece matted, right? So this is a fine art um, piece where I put masking tape around the outside edge, and then I took it to the framer and they put a mat around the edge and in the frame. So this is kind of nice because it speaks to um, photography as we know it, sort of like, you know matted and framed um you could carry them in a portfolio case that way um you can show them easily you can also if you tear the edges you could also mat them or stick them to a mat board and also put them in a sleeve or portfolio case right and if you're working on paper i recommend that you frame the final piece and if you're working on a substrate or a board i recommend not frame it okay okay so when i get over here to this table i use one of my straight edges and i do um oh sorry i do like a nice i just do like a nice hand tear right so that's one example um you could also use an exacto knife um, or a razor blade if you want to do a sharper edge right so here's the exacto knife right so this is going to be a super sharp straight flush full bleed right in like can you see, and you can see the difference in contrast to this toothy more freestyle and then of course your other choice is totally freestyle where you're just pulling pulling up the outside edge and leaving it very irregular right and of course, there's also the opportunity to maybe even do like an organic shape. 
such as, you know, totally organic or possibly even um, oval, right? Curved or slightly curved or, or um, even rounded edges. So look, here's like a nice like circle edge right down here at the bottom, right? So lots of, lots of outside edge choices. And honestly, like, this is kind of cool that it has like four, four different, <laughs> four totally different edges. And I'm just gonna leave it like that because I like it. I like it and I like that we did it together. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also, now I'll show you the masking edge. So I'm gonna go back over here to this table. Um, I use a lot of masking tape in my studio. Masking tape is my friend. I actually have a box of masking tape. Ma I have a box. I, I have a fancy green box of masking tape. But um, painter's tape or blue tape is nice. Um, and what you can do is you can cut pieces and stick them to your table so that you're loosening the adhesive on the back. Right, because if they're too sticky, they might pull pull up um, the paper um, and rough up the, the surface of the print, which which is not a terrible thing. I mean, maybe you like that, but you can also stick them to your apron, and then you can also reuse them. So a lot of times, I you might find me with like multiple pieces of masking tape on my apron or my table. And then I'm gonna pull them up a couple times, which just minimizes their stickiness. And then I'm gonna take the print. Now this can be used, and I'll talk about this as we start painting with the wax, but you can use this to block off an area of the photo that you don't want wax on. And in this case, I'm just doing the edges. So I'm gonna have this really nice separation between wax surface and print surface, right? And if you over mat it for presentation, your, your viewers will get to see the difference between straight photo paper and all of the added material, the beauty of the encaustic material that you added to the surface of the image, okay? Because you're creating um, contrast between naked paper and wax paper, right? Um, this is also nice too sometimes to have the masking tape on the print so that you can maybe even tape it to the table so as you're brushing or scraping or painting that the print isn't moving around while you're working on it. Okay, so I have this one ready to go now, right? One. I have this one also ready to go, right? So I'm going to set these two aside and we're going to talk about mounting photos to substrates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I have a number of different substrates here. I have a nice uh, three quarter inch plywood, right? From Home Depot. Okay. I have a nice cradle, cradled wooden panel right? They can be purchased from online, uh, Dick Blick, um, Cheap Joe's, right? Has good cradle panels. Um, they come in every size. I have a half inch piece of plywood from uh, Home Depot. I have a sheet of industrial uh, metal. This is called um, dye bond. And this is kind of a fun substrate because it's so darn thin. So thin. Lightweight. Very lightweight. Right? And you better believe that I wish that I was working on dye bond for those 48 by 60s instead of my 50 pound wood <laughs> because that thing almost knocked me over yesterday. <laughs> I was like, um, can somebody help me? So this stuff is, uh, comes from a place called Harbor sales. It's, um, like, it's like a compound of, um, 
I think it's like plastics with just a little bit of an with a little bit of aluminum coating both sides. So it's fairly cheap. You can order it from them and they can cut it. So I was thinking it'd be cool to do this cool shape, right? Which is like kind of long and rectangular with this like interesting crop right? It's like half. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and then I like sometimes mounting a photo to a panel that's bigger than the photo. So I can use uh, the outside extra space for collage or painting or what about just <clears throat> nothing? Like what about minimalistic? What about just like a solid color, right? Quiet space. I think that's what they call that quiet space. I think that's what they call that. <laughs> um, I did throw in here in our mix, I did throw in here a cheap, I want to emphasize the word cheap, uh, <laughs> oh. crappy canvas. panel, canvas. I wanted to throw this in here as a possibility. So I can definitely tell you what can go wrong with this one, but I don't, I just think it's fine. We'll just, I just want to play with it. And a lot of things can go wrong with this one. So this is like our, this would be like our slowest course in the race, uh, the least likely to finish successfully, <laughs> but we're going to throw them in there anyway, just for fun. Um, okay. Any questions with that? I don't, I don't want to stay here on the boring stuff if you guys are cool with it, but I don't want to go too fast. So good are we good yeah good right and if anybody has questions about um I, I think that panel i'm gonna just give you my my little opinion here so i think that panel work is 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 not better or worse but harder because i feel like mm -hmm. once you get to the panel you feel like more committed you've invested some money um you've glued the pit piece the uh, um but i have to tell say two two good things on that is that i have a box right here i'm kicking it right now with my left foot and it's a box that's overfilled with what i call ter you know shit like terrible art okay <laughs> so the reason that i keep it is because it's pieces that I've tried and things that I've made that I don't like anymore, but that are on a panel. So they're not going to go in the trash because they're on a panel. And the good thing about encaustic wax is that these pieces could pop up one day. I could pull them out of there. I could add another photo to it. I could add another layer, a layer of wax and it could all of a sudden turn into like the best thing I ever made, you know? So don't ever feel like you're, you know, making a bad investment. Um, photos can be taken down. You mean you can take a panel, you can peel, you can, you can use a heat gun, you can take all that wax off, you can burn off that photo or scrape off the photo that you glued on there, sand it with a belt sander, sander and then guess what? You have a beautiful, like, deteriorated, rough, cool, new start. Okay, so those are the good things about the panels. Um, the bad thing about the canvas in particular or any type of um, mat board or board is that, and even some plywoods is that they want to warp. I, like they're almost guaranteed to, and look, I can totally bend this can't, like bend or warp. And that is just really the worst thing um, that you can do to your wax because uh, oh, yeah. Because your wax wants to be flat and brittle. So if you put it on something that's bendy, it's gonna probably chip or crack or fall off, okay? I mean, not right away, um, but over time. You could work on panel, especially something thin like this, and then figure out a way to nail it or screw it um, into a board, right? And then the board would become it's secure background and that could be like an interesting way to work because there is something beautiful about working on like a fabric right on a fabric textured surface there is something beautiful about that um and i actually just recently had a conversation with another artist who was talking about 
printing on muslin and gluing the muslin to the substrate and then adding wax, which I just was like, just wanted to do it. Like, as soon as we started talking about it, I just like wanted to like stop everything and, go and do that. Right? Yes. Could, could you use watercolor paper, like uh, the more textured watercolor paper? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. So the thing for me, and we're gonna actually talk about this right now, so that was a great, great segue. Um, I have been gluing photos to boards um, for over 20, 20 years. So, <clears throat> and we're talking like big photos to big boards, glossy photos, um, photos printed on watercolor paper, photos printed on heavy rag paper. Um, at this point in my life, the lighter, the thinner, the paper, the better. And I'm gonna say that for many reasons. One is that I'm tired and I don't want to scrape a, you know, a photo to a panel for two hours to get all the air bubbles out. I don't want to use a heavy glue that's gonna take all of my arm strength and effort to get on there even. Um, I just don't wanna put that physical work into that part of it. There's other parts that I wanna save my energy for. So I like any paper under 200 GSM, especially I like the rice papers right now. Um, like the 90, 90, the Hanamule 90 GSM. Also this photo rag, I mean, you can hear how flexible it is and it's like a 188, right? So that's grams per square meter. So it's a very lightweight, beautiful paper. And basically when I put it on the glue, it just goes like this. It just goes whoosh, like suctions right to it very few air bubbles and doesn't come off, okay? And basically what we're doing with this photo encaustic work is we're building like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? So we're basically layering, right? So at the end of the day, this original layer is, it, it's like irrelevant. It, it becomes unimportant what the actual paper was, right? that went into the sandwich. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. it, it really, the things about the paper in the beginning are sort of how they rough up, how they absorb the chalk, how they react to underpainting. So those are the reasons that you're picking like a toothy paper, a, a rice paper or a matte paper is like what kinds of under do you want to sand it a lot do you want it to be smooth to draw on do you want it to be bumpy to draw on right so it's kind of like it, it think about it as driving for a second like if you're driving on a gravel road with rocks on it that's one experience you know if you're driving in philadelphia with millions of potholes like <laughs> and large obstacles in the road and trash like that's another road experience if you're driving in germany on the autobahn you know that's flat and perfect that's a completely different experience so paper is a little bit like that um and you can choose the one that you like the best um and and i still kind of work with all three of these papers but only under for if I'm mounting to a panel, it's got to be under 200 GSM because I don't want the stress of trying to glue a heavy paper to a wood panel because I don't want to use a glue that is not water soluble, like rabbit skin glue, or um, I don't want to use a, a carcinogenic uh, Super 77 glue. I want to be able to use my book binding glue. Um, and I want to be able to roll it on or use a foam brush and cover a large area and put that thing down quick. I do want to mention though, since you guys are lucky to be here for this uh, little chapter of my life, and I've done these large pieces before, but can you see what I did is I seamed them. Do you see the, 
right? Do you see that? So I took a 48 by 60 and I divided it into nine 16 by 20 prints and then I just put it back together. So there um, is some beautiful encaustic work by the St Doug and uh, Mike Starn, the Starn twins. And they do encaustic and they take a, a photo or a piece and they rip it up into squares and then they reassemble it using the, the encaustic. So I like that idea too. Um, and we can kind of, we can do a piece like that now as we work on the panels where we could, we could just free, you could almost just free tear, like I could free tear up this photo and then reassemble it on the panel, right? So that could be one of my, my underpinnings. Okay. So I'm gonna just take a minute to set up um, the gluing. And one of the other things that I do while I'm gluing is I start painting. So I do a combo of encaustic gesso and uh, PVA glue. So if, if any of you guys are working right now alongside me, you could have already torn photo edges or cut photo okay. edges. You could have possibly um, masked with masking tape photo yeah. edges. Um, you could have also gotten your panels out. You could have also drawn or uh, on the photos or sandpapered any of your photos. Okay. So, um, question. Yes, please. Um, are we going to take these panels and gesso them so they're white? No, no, I do not gesso for um, safety reasons. Okay. I used to do that. I don't, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are meeting me at a stage in my life where I want to get right to the fun stuff. <laughs> and I don't want to do anything that isn't fun. So gessoing piano <laughs> is on my list of things that was not that fun and took a lot of my energy and I don't want to do that anymore. So I don't think that there's enough acid in this panel to hurt my photo and I'm not going to live long enough even if it does. Okay. So, the so Say that again. A print right to the board. I say print a board. Now you could, this is actually good. You can buy gessoed panels. Yep. And uh, if I had, if I had like all the money in the world, I would, or maybe I should get Ampersand to sponsor me, but Ampersand makes the most beautiful gessoed panels for encaustic painting. So, but they're very expensive. They're, they're, um, but, and they're very, again, just like, they're very nice. If you, the only reason that you would, the reason that I use gesso is for what I call text. It's a, it's an art thing for me. Um, yeah. This is my example I was working on yesterday to show you guys. But like, I have a lot of little like side hobbies, I call them. So, there's this, there's like this thing about, about art for me is that like, I have the, I know what I, what I'm known for and like, sort of like what I do to perform and make my art. But there's a lot of things that I need to do to support that direction. And some of the things that I need to do are just like mess around, like play, like make stuff, like, practice and so these are what I call like my they're like my art exercises so this is encaustic gesso heat gun and lead pencil and like I kind of like I mean it's you know it's not my it's not my art but it is my art right like and I could maybe figure out how to like you know add a photo to a portion of this or add some wax I mean then again sometimes you just need time and spaces where you're not like making something you're just making right like you know does that yeah 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 and i thought this was fun because like first of all this shows off how beautiful just the raw wood is 
And it also shows off the tone of the wood in comparison to the gesso. So my point is that gesso is very bright white. And the reason that I like to use it uh, in my photo collages and on around my photos is that when you add wax to it or colored translucent layers of wax, you're going to see the true color of the wax, right? Uh -huh. Whatever your under color is, is going to affect the way the translucent color appears. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind because what we're gonna end up doing with the encaustics is painting in translucent layers, right? So we're gonna talk about how to paint in translucent layers. So painting on wood or painting on dark gray or painting on brown or sepia or color is totally different than painting from bright white, right? And you'll also notice when you're painting from bright white how yellow wax medium is, right? So wax, right? You can see right here, right? You can see right here how yellow wax medium is in comparison to bright white gesso. And the only reason I even mention this is just because I've been a photographer for so long and I honestly used to really try to teach my college students that every single brand of paper used a different amount of bleach in their paper chemistry. So some papers that you would buy, especially um, you know Kodak or, or uh, Ilford would be very white based, whereas some other papers like Agfa would be different color, like the background, the base color would be cream or even ivory. Okay, so I won't go on too much longer about that. I love, um, aluminum like cooking trays for the studio or paper plates. Um, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of like spending too much time cleaning, cleaning up. So uh, that's like another thing that I don't like to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but if I use this for glue, I can just put glue in it and not wash it and then put more glue in it. Does that make sense? So it's like a gluing tray. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna use both the roller and the foam brush. So I put the PVA glue in the pan. So is, that, is this what you're using? Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's yeah. it. Yes, that's it. Yep, okay. and, yep that's just a different manufacturer than I have. You're, uh, I'm mine. Yep, that, uh, yeah, that's fine. That's, a, yeah, that's gambling, that's good stuff. Yep. What? Either one. Okay. I would use the one on your right. I would use the one on your right. This one. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would use that one. Okay. Then I think this stuff is a little bit too sticky for me. And it, so I like to add a little bit of water. Okay. A little bit of water. So like we're talking, you know, a couple for a tray full, we're talking like, I'm talking like a three or four drops. Okay, and then you can just take the back of a paintbrush and just mix it in, mix it. And just mix it in. And then if I'm using my foam brush, I'm not gonna use this one because this foam brush is having a skin disorder. <laughs> it's, having, it's having a, it's having a, it's having a foam meltdown. Uh, actually, this is funny. These are all, this one has, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> so I'm gonna use the best, the best looking foam brush that I have. And one of the things that might be important to you before you start is lay out your boards that you have, right? Lay out your boards that you have and also lay out the prints that you have, and you can start to figure out what are the best matches. Now, in a perfect world, I would have sized these to match my boards, but because I um, kind of did that, I'm going to just mix them. I didn't do them exactly, but I'm gonna mix and match. Okay, so I, did, I have four pieces here. So I'm gonna do this one on the, uh, with the white around it. 
I'm gonna do this cool. Uh, I'm gonna do this cool crop this vertical on this nice longer vertical piece. Right. This is the die bond. I'm gonna crop this one to fit this board, and I'm gonna crop this one to fit this board. Okay. Um, sometimes when I crop like this, I just make my life easier instead of going back to my other table is I just put the board on top of the photo. I just put the board right on top of the photo. I kind of figure out where I want it. And then I just tear around the outside edge. So I just put this hand here and I just tear around the outside edge. That probably looks terrifying to somebody, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and then sometimes, okay, so this is interesting. So if I want to go outside, if I wanted to go, I could go larger than the panel. And that's kind of an interesting idea. So if I go a little bit larger than the panel, I could have just these extended paper edges. So you can see from the back, you could have just a little bit of a paper edge extending outside the panel, which would make the photo look like it was floating. The wax mm. was floating off the edge. And if you did, a little bit more than the panel you could actually even try like curved edges or you could have like trippy waxy edges which could also be really beautiful right if you just went slightly larger than the panel okay so those are other fun ideas now uh i'm just gonna take that and put it over here i'm just gonna go ahead and do this one And I'm just going to do the same thing. Now I could also use, of course, I could use an X-Acto knife or uh, a razor blade, right? But back on my cutting, I don't like to cut on my table because that will mess up my paper. Okay, so there's my second one, right, on 11 by 14 board. Now this one, I am going to um, tear off the white edges. I don't want, I don't want the white the white edges, right? But this would be a perfect example of a great image to use the masking tape technique, right? Because I would have this nice white paper border um, on it. All right, so I'm just gonna fold and tear, which is just gonna help me do this more quickly. So I'm just gonna fold, I'm just gonna fold and tear just to keep going. And I, I love to fold and tear paper, photo paper. I just think it's, I just think photo paper is the best. And it's so soft and fun and it, to tear. And I don't care, and I can just free rip it at the top, it's fine. Okay. So the die bond, it, it, it has, it's white, but you can't, you can order it in white. So you figure out. Now this is interesting. So. I, now that I have this empty space, I need to, did you guys freeze? Oh, oh. hey. Where are you? you are. Hey, hey, I'm back. I was like, wait, did you guys freeze? Oh, we're still frozen. Are we back? Oh, hi. You guys there? I hear yeah. you, but I don't I see you. We don't see you. We oh, don't see wait, you. Here. You're no longer the main video. Oh, I'm not the main Here one. you are. There oh, you there are. You are. Oh, hi, everybody. Oh, my God. I was so <laughs> sad. I was so sad. I was just <laughs> in myself in my studio. <laughs> okay. So, so have we started gluing or no? Uh, wait one second. So wait, let me just show you this. I was going to ask you guys. I was going to ask your opinion, okay? so. Um, I have this photo and then I have this extra space. So do you think I, sh I could bottom weight it? I should bottom weight it, right? Because the bottom weight just, I think, makes the most sense to me. Bottom weight, yep. Bottom weight, it, yep. Everybody? Bottom. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Why are you going to bottom weight it? I don't know. I don't understand. Um, I think I'm going to bottom weight it just because I feel, I feel like it's going to give me the most, most painting opportunities because, 
I'm probably gonna embellish this flower area and grow it like out. So if I put her at the top, I'd to, then I'd have to paint like a skirt or create like a, a, a create like a separate universe here, right? Or a separate like a bottom versus the top. I mean, I could put it in the middle. Mm -hmm. No, but I no. Think I think I want to deal with like this, like class, like the sky, and I find more metaphor and inspiration in this area to paint than the bottom. So okay, okay. So you, know, you guys, if you're gluing along with me, you can go right ahead. I did want to tell you though that this is my favorite new friend, and this is a fluffy painting roller. But I use this on the large pieces, and I just loved it. Um, so because it rolled, it rolled in the glue, right? And then it rolled, it rolled in the glue and then it rolled right on the, see how it's rolling in the glue? Oh my God, I love it. It's so <laughs> nice. And then I just roll right in this area, right on the panel. So for the dive on, I'm gonna put, it doesn't, for a collage, I'm gonna put the glue on the panel. And if I'm doing the whole piece, I'm gonna put the glue um, on the piece. So here I just put the glue under and I'm just going to put the piece down. Okay, so for this one, I'm probably going to put the glue on the print. So I'm going to flip the print over. I'm going to roll and then look how nice you guys. This is so, I'm telling you, this is so much better. Oh, that is cool. It's so cool. And then that's it. Just roll it and then you can switch directions is helpful. So you make sure you get all the corners. You really want to make sure you get corners, right? Corners. Question, Leah. Yep. Question. So um, I noticed that like some of that glue is going to get on the front of your your image the way you turn the print. You don't you don't need to worry about the wax not adhering to that, no. the, those bits of glue that might be on your photo. No, I don't. You know what? It might. I don't really think there's that much glue on here, and I'm. It's gonna dry before I wax it, and I'm not gonna have a problem with that. It's not gonna be a Leah? lot of quantity. Nope. And Leah? I'm. Just, yeah. Then I don't have the roller. Would I be able to use one of the um, no. brushes? That don't use that brush. You, don't use it. Okay. No, don't use that brush. But you know what? You can use. Okay. This is the phone? No, you know what you can use? Hello. All right. Oh, paper towel. Got it. So, yeah, don't waste that nice brush. Yeah, do not waste that hockey brush. No, I'll be okay. I'll be upset with you. Um, that's an expensive <laughs> brush. So just take, look, I'll do it for you right now. So just take paper towel and go right into the glue tray, or you could just pour the glue onto the back of the photo and then use the paper towel to blend it. If you do not have a foam brush or a roller. The only thing about the roller though, I have to tell you is that it um, uses a lot of glue. Like you just notice that the glue gets absorbed a lot partially into the roller. But definitely, it definitely covers a lot of ground quickly. And what I always do is I always make sure that I, that I cover all of my areas of my photo, like that I can't lift any of the ed outside edges up, and then definitely check for air bubbles. So the best tool that I found um, for checking air bubbles, you can use like a plastic wedgie, or you can use a credit card. Um, I just use my hand. I, I mean, I just really use my fingers. I really use my fingers. I also really use the meaty part of my thumb right here and really like turn my hand on the side and really use that to press into the photo. Right? And I don't see any, I don't see or feel any air bubbles. Okay. 
So this one looks good. I got two done. And I had to add more glue. I had to add more glue to my tray, and I'm going to add a couple of drops of water, a couple of drops of water, and then blend that up, right, with my paintbrush. And if you're using the foam brush, you can use the foam brush to blend, and the foam brushes are good, like this is a nice, right? And these are fun to paint with, too, foam brushes. I definitely prefer the roller though. That's by far the best. <laughs> also for me, you guys, in my studio, I try to do like my, my gluing, like my printing on one day, my gluing on another day, right? So like, and then maybe I'll um, do some watercolors on the photos and then let them dry. Sorry. Okay, fine. okay, here we go. Oh, this one's, this one's slightly over there. All right, I have one more to do. So this one's kind of cute. It has like a little, it has like a little tab extending over this side of the panel. I'm just gonna leave it for now. It could be nice if you actually really thought about it. It could be cool to glue. Do you guys see what just happened there? Where I could run a little glue and the photo could actually go around the outside edge of the panel and get glued down to the panel. Cool, that's beautiful. That, that's really nice. And then you could also, if you wanted to do that and maybe only on one side, you could take like, um, a collage paper or a ribbon or another texture and add something to this outside edge. I, I do think, I know I love this wrapping around. It's really nice, right? And then I could kind of like crease it, right? I could even scratch it with my fingernail to kind of make it almost like a, a bind. It could look like a book. Like you could literally intend some, you know, like keep this spine here and the lines kind of like make it like a book and you could put like white little white lines over here so that from far away it actually looks like these were the you know would open it's kind of a clever clever little thing i like that all right i'm gonna do one more and this one too so i'm gonna um tear these outside edges at the bottom down here and i'm going to um this one's gonna be a little bit smaller than my canvas, right? So I like the idea of the photo not fitting the canvas. I think it's it's just good for me to do some that aren't um, cookie cutter, right? That are a little, give me a little bit of blank canvas around the photo that I can play with. Right, it's kind of fun to have that extra, extra space to think about possibilities. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. So I'm gonna flip this one over. I like this, I think I like this roller too because of the long handle. I don't know why, but the the longer handle of the paint, this is kind of fun. Now, this could be a cool, this could make some pretty cool textures yeah with paint too all right I'm gonna... and i've got this ridiculous hair i don't know if you guys can see it but it's totally bugging me i have this tiny little white margin hair right here <laughs> that thing's gotta go that's gotta go right that little that little white i mean i could have easily just colored it too but okay and I'm gonna let my deckled edge go right down to the bottom. All right. So I don't wanna talk for too, too long, but um, about collage, but, oh, and shoot, wait, hold on a second, hold on a second. We just, we just, we just roared right past that. All right. Um, I'm gonna go backwards, sorry. Is everybody watching me? Yep. Okay, so, 
I wanted to talk about, um, I want to talk about taking something apart and putting it back together. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do it here. So this is what I did with the big pieces as I printed them. And this is kind of a cool technique. I'll send you um, my friend um, Camille, his, his web address, but he's an acoustic painter and he uses the idea of sort of like this um, extra, I always call him like the extra square. So like after he glues his photo on while he's working at the collage, he does one portion of the image in a sepia toned square, like, and adds it to the collage on top. Um, actually, I could do screen share maybe for whatever reason. Uh, do you guys want to see? I'll show you his work real quick. Yeah. Okay, so hold on, I got my arm in the. His name is Camille um Wagner and he lives in San well he lives in France but he was living in Santa Monica for a long time so and he uses a, like a wax he uses wax as a uh, as a surface as a surface finish mm. um but most of his coloring and stuff I think he does um in Photoshop but do you see how um he added yeah. The, the tone, like the tone. So here's the sepia toned, paintedly looking image. And then here's the square of sort of like the target of what he wants you to pay attention to. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's nice too. I mean, that could be, this is a nice one. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. beautiful, oh, wow. beautiful color. Um, this is actually one of my favorite ones of his. I love this one. My favorite, my fave. He does a lot with angels and this is kind of neat. And, but do you see how the split tone, like split toning yeah. really um, makes it so three dimensional and pop. And it also just, it's very poetic. I, I really I think that's nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get that fancy uh, here, although, wait a second, although. So he's not putting the photograph on top of, he's just. He is, he's putting, well, no, he's putting, he's doing a lot of Photoshop work and okay. then he's not, paint, and then oh. he's at, he, he puts them on, he mounts those photos onto canvases and he coats them, just coats them with wax. And then adheres that one additional black and white square to the painting. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind oh, of like okay. a final, it's like a final added elements. So here I am, I, I sectioned this image. Okay, wait. Okay, so this would be like my version. Now I could have maybe even come, so this is this same picture, right? Twice, but in two different tones. Oh yeah. So I'm going to sacrifice this print. I'm actually going to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay all of these down and I sectioned them. Do you see how they have seams in them? So oh, yeah. now I can even leave a space. Like I could, I could just get rid of the top of her head. I could extend it like this, which is. That's right? cool. Yeah. yeah, that could be cool. Um, which sort of it's sort of introducing that idea of fragmentation or um, abstraction, whatever other you know emotional. All right, so <clears throat> I'm just going to do this last one, and then I could cut this other piece up. I'm going to sacrifice. Just sacrifice it. I'm gonna put this one up here just because it might look cool in the corner. But this was our other. So I could cut this one, right? And I could do this now, or I could do this later, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do it now. So like for me, this would be the most important part of the picture. 
right? And then I could put it, I could reconnect it. Oh, nice. Nice. Very right. nice. My finger's in the middle, so sorry. And I kind of wish I made it a little bit higher to go over that white space, but I could do this more than one time. I could put the her here. Yeah, it is kind of cool, huh? Wait, let's see. I to, I'm using her pair. It's really hard to put photos back together and make them look right. Okay. And I, I can like literally change the size of her nose, you guys. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm not exactly, oh, there you go. Wait, I can't exactly tell. It's funny how you can't exactly tell. All right, so I'm gonna, I'll glue this one on. I, I kinda like it. All right, so we have a split toning example. All right, whoa, I love it. So cool, so cool, so fun. I'm so having so much fun. All right. <laughs> Oh, wait, a hairline. I feel like the one, oh, you know what it is, you guys? The one is slightly smaller. The one print is slightly smaller than the other print, but I don't, I think it's, I think it's okay. I think it's going to be okay. All right, there we go. I got it on there. All right, I'm going to switch gears from gluing. Any questions on gluing? Can we um, see that one? Any questions on gluing? No. And is anybody adding, um, I know Melissa, is anybody adding extra um, ephemera or papers? Um, I, I'd like to. Okay. Do you want me to? So I would recommend light, lightweight papers. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you could put fabric in there, like lace, or um, I like to use uh, old letters. This is actually, does anybody know what this is? It's kind of funny. Yeah. Is it, do you know what it is? Uh -uh. Piano roll of paper? No. Yes. Is it? Yes. yes, Linda wins the prize. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Woohoo! It's, um, yeah, it's from the, um, Self-playing pianos? Yeah. It's the piano rolling paper. And I got a whole roll of it. It's such a beautiful paper. It's so cool. Because um, it has those little holes in it, and it's very thin. So, and it's nice. It's nice. It gives texture. I also really like to use um, old letters. <clears throat> so, um, I have a box. I also like to buy sort of like the handmade papers. Uh, I like to buy the handmade papers from, you know, like uh, I like paper source, paper source or Dick Blick. So like, here's a couple examples um, of like some old, old letters. Um, the thing I like about the old letters is just the, the handwriting and um, this one's in blue, which is fairly unusual that it's in blue. Um, this type of paper is really cool too. I find sometimes that using too much color in my underpaintings um, becomes a little bit problematic for me because I can't then escape that color. Right. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's why I like to keep a lot of my underpaintings in neutral color palettes, such as white, cream, ivory, light brown, light gray, or black. Because red, blue, yellow, green, orange, they become dominant and then they get either conflict, I get conflicted with them at a later date, right? Or I decide that I don't like them anymore and I can't, uh, I can't completely change them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of collage. Um, a lot of time, this is my like adv advice on collage, is um, maybe lay it out and take a photo of it, mm -hmm. right? So if I made, you know, if I put a couple, just kind of like we did with the wax paper, 
you know, um, put some things down on the board where you think you're going to like them and uh, take a picture. And remember though, this is like under collage, like it's not going to have that, that, you know, it's, it's going to con control how your piece looks, but it's not the end of the, it's not the end all. All right, because we're going to add a couple encaustic layers to this. But it is nice to have um, underneath texture or imagery um, to kind of play around with and to have to reflect back on as you add layers of wax, right? So I'm going to take a picture of this one. I'm going to take a picture of this collage for the Google, for the Google album. So we have it. I'm not going to spend time gluing it down right now. But I treat the papers the same as the photos. And I just put glue, the PVA glue on the back of them. And then I definitely let everything dry. I let everything dry for at least 24 hours before I wax. Okay. So I can just go ahead and quickly, I'll just go ahead and quickly do this. So another reason why I like to kind of have like a gluing party while I have all the gluing materials out, right? And then let everything dry. And then when, after it's dry, it also gives you another opportunity to use sandpaper, right? To smooth out your edges, make sure everything's glued down and everything's exactly what you want it before or you start waxing, right? Because the next time we meet, next week we're gonna be waxing. I'm just gonna put this. Also, if you, this roller is a little bit big for these papers. And if anybody likes to do like paper cutting, you know, like cutting out objects or fine paper cutting, that's always really interesting too. It's nice to have things, layers, um, weaving together, I call it, right? So here I, I had done this earlier, but I kind of, I did a little, I did a little cut, cutting on that, on this flower here so that I could put it over, so I could put it over the other, over the image, right? So I'm starting to think about these layers weaving together. So this one went under this one. Okay, and this one went over. And you can see how bumpy they are. So I'm just gonna spend some time using my palm to kind of just smooth them out. Um, if you like the texture of the bumps or if you end up wrinkling the papers, that's A-okay. It's not a big deal. Wrinkles are good. I like wrinkles. Um, if you wanted to glue some tissue paper on here, that could be cool, or, or dress pattern paper, something light brown, um, anything like that, all right? Um, if you're feeling the need to, your maybe your surface has gotten a little bit of wet, you can always add the heat gun, you guys, right? Add the heat gun to dry the glue a little bit more quickly if you're feeling like you want it to be drier more quickly. But I even love the way um, like this, this guy overlaps this guy and this guy overlaps that, that right? Some nice, you know, do I see that? Okay. So I think the last thing I'm going to do is already 245 and time has gone very, very quickly. I wanted to demonstrate a little bit of what I do with encaustic gesso as part of my underpainting. So I just need to clean my table and make a little room because I'm going to be moving around. Yeah. <laughs> Got to have a little elbow room here. So I'm going to just put my painting stuff. Of course, this would get washed in water, soapy water. This I don't wash. Okay. So this can go on my lovely art table and this can go I have to like put it in my way of the door 
or else I'll forget it. So I like literally put it like somewhere between my path from my studio to the kitchen. So I just put it, I'm gonna put it over here so I don't forget it on this wax paper. So that I will wash. I'm gonna put the top on my glue, which is very important. If I can find it, because I'm always losing the top to the glue. And I'll find that later. So um, I have to say that encaustic gesso is like one of my favorite, I think my new favorite materials. Oh, and I wanna put you guys over here. Hold on one second. I wanna put you over here just cause I think the lighting is better. All right. So now I have uh, these boards and the, these ladies and I did a little, oh, I didn't do any, I didn't do any black uh, chalk drawing on these guys. So I'm gonna actually do a little bit of that and I didn't do any sanding on them either. So I'm going to do both. Um, I'm gonna work on this one. I want to work on this one because I'm just interested in it. This is the one on the canvas. Uh, I'm just kind of interested in it because we did that split toning. We added those two prints together and I'm just, just like it. So I have a pile of stencils over here and I'm going to grab them. So in classic gesso, I always do, I always put this on uh, the panels before I do in caustic. And um, like, I think you guys, can you guys see this one? So this is a larger piece that I'm making. So you can see this white, these white polka dots. I put the, the photo together in seams, right? And then I, I start to sort of begin this abstracty sort of painterly conversation with the encaustic gesso. Okay, so um, I just use the polka dotted stencil. I use the flower stencil. I just paint it in this corner, right? So I just sort of start to like paint around the composition with the encaustic gesso. And what's really nice about it too is that I can burn. I can burn both the wood, I can burn the photo, the wood, and the gesso if I use my torch, right? So here's my, here's my torch. So I can use, do you guys see how I'm using this? Like I'm literally like, it's almost like I'm spray painting. Oh my God. Right? You guys see, I'm almost like spray painting. But I could not wait to do this because I really wanted this to start to look like clouds. So that's a burn. So that's a burn, right. And the, what happens is that the encaustic gesso for the most part stays white and the wood goes dark, which I just think is such a fun, cool technique. Now, you could be using the burning on like the outside edges of the panel, right? Around the edges of the photo. I'm gonna do it with a photo too. Of course, I, I can't do it on this one because it's a, a canvas, but I can do it with this one. Uh, and I can't do it with the dye bond. You can't, you can't do it on the, with the dye bond. So I'm just going to, I'll demonstrate on this one. So I had already glued this photo here, right? And I have this encaustic gesso flowers. And then I can go around the outside and add some tonality. Right? So I can sort of start to blend. I always call it like blending. I can sort of start to blend these light areas and dark areas. 
by going around the outside of the encaustic gesso and burning. And the, burning the wood, is that correct? Not I'm thinking. burning the wood, right. I'm burning the wood that's not, and what I love the most is creating these positive and negative spaces. Do you guys see how that flower, like that little flower form just appeared there? Popped up, yeah. Where it just like popped 3D because the gesso is going to And then I love these spaces like in between photograph, gesso, and wood, right? These sort of very organic, like beautiful spaces that happen here. Can you do that on a board that's gessoed already? No, this board is naked. This board was <laughs> naked. This is encaustic gesso here, Judy. This white, everywhere it's white is encaustic gesso. This is naked board. And then this is the photo. Okay, but I'm gonna show you how I put the gesso on. But like in this piece, I didn't leave, I didn't leave any naked wood. Mm. Right, so, but I could burn these edges, but I'm going to show you how I put the gesso on. So for me, when I first started using the gesso, what I thought about was um, white out, like when you were in like the office or when we remember when we used to type and stuff and we would have to use white out to like, cause we spelled our <laughs> name wrong or something. Like, so sometimes I'll use a foam brush or a paper towel. And I think like maybe, again, like I wanna focus on this elbow because as much as I love, as much as I love this pose, like how many, how many pictures have I, have I taken of girls with their elbows out, right? So like, <clears throat> I just feel like this whole area needs to get softened and this is distracting. So I could sand it with sandpaper, right? Which I probably should do. <laughs> So first I can sand it. And remember what I said about sanding is it's not only distorting the image, but it's also uh, acting as a, as a lightener, right? It's lightening this area. And then I could think about elaborating, like making these flowers brighter. So I sort of just start to use the encaustic gesso to like add these elements, you see? And I'm right. <laughs> I'm like just literally like sort of painting as if these stems are coming up and these are all just becoming floral forms, right? I could also sort of veil her hand a little bit. And to me, like just using this pattern is like all I need. It's like to sort of create this effect. If I also wanted to add more like highlights to this part of her dress, Right, so again, I can use it to highlight an area, right, to block out content or to sort of elaborate and create fantasy, right? So three little, little uh, purposes for my encaustic gesso. If I wanted to be more deliberate with it, I could take a stencil, right? If I wanted to introduce some pattern or, or repetition, I could go ahead and lay my stencil down. I'm gonna point you guys down the ground. Lay my stencil right here. Um, I can take a foam brush. This one's too big for my jar, so I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna trim my foam brush for a second. <laughs> the one that, look at that. All right, there we go. And again, I'm, I'm just sort of play, like playing. I'm, I, you know, I don't have to be totally married to any of these marks that I'm making, um, but I'm just sort of beginning this fun conversation about adding design and pattern, you know, and uh, abstraction to these photos. But I do like, you know, you can pick your own, when you buy stencils, you'll pick your own stencils that you like. And look, I kind of got like an uneven sort of not perfect pattern here, this kind of bled together. But I really love this like tiny little like dots that happen there. So again, just sort of evoking 
painterly qualities. And I'm starting to sort of, now I'm going back to my chalk. I'm starting to really sort of see and feel positive and negative space, you know, and where I can kind of make things pop a little bit. And again, I love the chalk because I can blur it, right? I could kind of blend the gesso a little bit if I wanted to with my finger or brush. But I think for a small piece, this already has a lot going on, so I'm just gonna let it go for now. But now if you wanted to get rid of the, the part of the gesso that's bled into one another, uh -huh. is that possible? Um, I, I wouldn't go and wipe it off. I mm -hmm. could go uh, wait till it dries and I could go over it again. Um, or I could draw around it and over it to kind of make them more circular, which would probably be my solution if I really wanted them circular, but kind of missed it. Okay. Um, I should have done a more careful job with the stencil and I know I could have gotten it more. You probably, because you're working flat, probably could have done a much better job than I just did. But Excuse me, Leah, how long would you wait for that gesso to be dry? Well, that's a really good question. So look, if I really wanted it to be dry right away, I can go ahead and take this heat to it and it's gonna have a really nice effect on it. So I can, and listen, how many of you are using the torch? I am. Torch. Okay, and how many of you are using the heat gun? I am that too. Okay, so I'll just go back and forth. I mean, they're fairly the same. I just really feel like you cannot get the same burning techniques from the heat gun that you can from the torch. So I'm going to go ahead and burn this one, but I'm also drying the drying it. And then as I'm burning the gesso, I'm toning the paper. I'm also toning the gesso and I'm causing a reaction, a heat reaction from the gesso. It's bubbling up. You guys see that? It's pretty cool. It's going to bubble up over here. Uh, it's gonna dry and bubble. I love it. And burn, which I love too. I love that really like totally alchemistic sort of, I don't know what the hell is gonna happen. <laughs> and look, that I'm right. really not, like I'm right. not really afraid. Like my photo is not like bursting into flames, but it's just like almost like tea staining mm -hmm. it. It's just slightly browning the photo, right? So once this is pretty good and like cooked up like a marshmallow, um, I could take a paper towel and sort of wipe off these sort of fragments. I don't think these little, little bubbles are strong enough to stay. I mean, if you're very, very gentle with the wax, they might stay. But for me, most of the time they just brush away. You could wax around them though you could wax around them and let them be the outside texture. Um, so I'm not gonna wipe them away, but they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool, right? I mean, and that looks like, that added so much dimension to this. Yeah. You know? Just like, it's kind of like, oh, it's like bubble, it's like in and out, like the black is going back and then this whole part is coming forward, right? And then if we wanted to see how it would look with wax on it, we could just quickly grab, and actually, we could quickly grab our wax paper and do the little wax test, right? To see how it looks with wax on it, you know? And then we can start thinking about what if the wax layer was blue or red or orange, like what tint it could be. Okay. So sorry, Leah, but if we, decided that we did not want to burn our uh, gesso, what, yeah. what would we wait, like about 24 hours for that to dry? Oh God, no, like a couple hours. Okay. Yeah, depending how thick you put it on. I mean, the thicker you put it on, the longer it's gonna take to dry. Okay. Um, also, you can do, you know, like bigger, let me just give one more example. It's, th it's three o'clock and I know a lot of you have other things you need to do, but. Let me just show you, like this is a really fun stencil for me because it's um, a pattern and it's also a circle. So I might use it like in a broader area. Can you point your, your camera down? Oh, 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 sorry, so sorry, yes, yes. So I put it, I put it right here on her head. It's just, right, I put it, I put it like, like a sun or like a, 
an arch over her. And I'm gonna use a little bit less gesso. Now, if you wanna keep these stencils really sharp, you could tape them with the masking tape, right, to hold them in place. And I don't, I'm not gonna burn this one. I can't burn this one too because it's on the canvas. I don't think that that's gonna be a good combo. <laughs> so I'm not gonna burn this one at all. I'm just, uh -huh. gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna. But this is gonna look beautiful. And this is such a nice stencil because it's not that like literal. It just, and it looks really great under wax too. And it kind of gives like a great 3D effect, right? Oh yeah, yeah, nice. Do you make some of your own stencils? You know what? I have not um, taken the time. It's a very time consuming task. Um, I have cut my, I, I buy stencils and I cut them and I layer them with other stencils. So I feel like I'm kind of like combining stencils in a way that just like have become my own um, sort of style. But no, I haven't, I would love to. I just haven't gotten that, that uh, ambitious. That would be, that sounds fun. I mean, and even like your kids, like, I mean, anything could be a great stencil. Your own font could be a great stencil. I even like sound object stencils, like um, produce bags or um, lace. And I'll talk about, like, I use a lot of lace. I buy a lot of lace and use lace in the wax. So we'll talk about that when we start waxing. Um, but yeah, the, you'll, you, once you start practicing like this, you'll start seeing things in the real world and you'll be like, oh my God. I could use that for my heart, you know, and you can use string, you can use buttons. There's a lot of things like from the house, um, from the kitchen that you could possibly put into your artwork. But um, I think I'm good on what I wanted to share with you today. I think um, that was a lot of information. I, I'm going to check and see if we got the recording. Um, I will do a follow up um, email with everybody. And um, before we meet next week, if you guys can all maybe have a, one ready for paper with the edge choice and at least one mounted to a panel is plenty for next week. Um, and next week we'll talk about wax medium, coating the surfaces of wax medium, um, how to use the heat gun, how to use the brushes. Uh, how to make stencil textures. We'll talk about all the basics of just wax medium. And then the third class will be adding color, right? So we'll talk, we'll talk about, you'll be really happy. You'll be happy to be ready and waxing next week. <laughs> I'm already happy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, and I'll excited. share, I'll take pictures of everything that I made in the studio with you guys today so that you can look more closely at them um, on the Google album. And if you did not have a Gmail address, I sent you a link to the Google album. And if you're having trouble with that, just please let me know and we'll figure out how to get you visibility to the pictures. Okay. Okay, and please send anything that you make um, this week. If you make, like if you add, gesso to, you know, or make a collage or anything that you want to share um, with the group. That would be awesome. And any questions before, any questions before we head back to our, back to our lives? Is there a Facebook group? Hmm. I do not currently have a Facebook group, Renee, but you could start one uh, and we could join it. I. I just have my Facebook, which I'll probably post pictures from today in. Um, but yeah, you mean so you guys can all get to know each other? You're all, all your emails are on um, the instructions for the class. But I, if you, we, you want to start a Facebook group? Sure, I can. Okay. I'll sure. call it photo, photo and caustics or sure. Sure. that would be awesome. Go for it. All right. I Thank love you. it. That would be great. I have a question for Nanette. Please. 
Nanette, what, what is behind you? Are those like two freaky, funky candlesticks with like dolls on them? Or what is that? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, you want me to show you? <laughs> if yeah. people don't mind, they just, I keep looking at them thinking, what are these <laughs> things? It's actually, it's a guy and his wife. They're pretty old now. But they oh, lived in New cool. York. Oh, and they fun. made these, um, Funky little can dolls. Oh my god! Oh, very cool. Oh my god! I love, cool. I love his cone head. Those are beautiful. <laughs> is that like an oil? I wonder. Is that like an oil funnel on his head? His little hand. No, it, um, I think it's like a trumpet. Yeah, no, you know, <laughs> metal. Uh -huh. I think he just put it on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. That's really cool. Thanks. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks for showing that. I can sleep tonight. <laughs> oh, and one more thing to just totally like put a, burst your bubble, but you can tint your encaustic gesso, you guys. So I'm going to give you a creative challenge before I see you next week. Think <laughs> about think about possibly tinting your encaustic gesso. Uh, so what could you tint it with? Anybody have any ideas before you go? Blowtorch, heating gun. Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah, you de well, you can like toast it like a marshmallow, Judy. You can you can tone it. It's almost like um, clay, and when you fire it, when they do that raku and they turn white clay like burnt, it's so beautiful. But when it's in its liquid phase, you could add. Does anybody can anybody think of something? What can you add? Food coloring. Uh, yeah, stick? you can add uh, not pigment stick, watercolors, you guys. Two uh -huh. watercolors to oh, encaustic gesso or powdered pigment. And what is uh, what do we love to cook with? Turmeric. Oh, Turmeric. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can add some turmeric to it, which, nice. which makes a beautiful, it makes like a beautiful ochery golden. Oh, mm -hmm. that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a pretty color. It's kind of like apricot. So if you wanted to add a little bit Love of it. the gesso, could be fun. And you can add the tube watercolor paints to the gesso. So if you wanted to do like brownie tones or and I would stick to the neutrals just because of what I said earlier about like, well, for me, I tend to be like, oh, I don't like this color anymore. <laughs> like uh, and I have a, you know, my work is very colorful right now because I'm just really still trying to learn, learn color because I was mostly a black and white photographer my whole, you know, and my first three colors were blue, brown, and yellow. <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love your blue. I love your ochre. Like, yeah. And, and that they're beautiful colors. You could only, I mean, Camille only works in those colors. He only works. That's all his work is like that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys, we have a great, great group. Um, I love everything everybody's sending me. Judy, I loved your pictures. Um, somebody else, Nanette, sent me pictures. Deb, did you send me pictures? Deb, I think, sent me pictures. Renee, I think, mm -hmm. sent me pictures. Yeah. So check out the Google album so you can see. I'm going to send you some pictures. Okay. And then let me see what you guys do this week. Okay. Bye, right, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. You made my day. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, Bye. Leah. Bye, Linda. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 See you guys this next week.